Hi all, I'd like to show you a fantastic game played between Anatoly Karpov and Gary Sparov in the 1984 aborted, dramatically aborted World Championship match aborted by Campomanes. And there's very dramatic footage about this match being aborted and Sparov's reaction to Campomanes. Uh, at the start of the match, Anatoly Karpov was dominating. He already had collected uh, three wins and there were a few draws, but he was actually, you know, free up. And um, in this game, Anatoly kicked off with d4. And we saw Kasparov play d5 and enter into the Tarash variation. So after knight f3, Kasparov played c5. Now this is this is an immortal game of Karpov and his handling against this Tarash system. But there's a lot of paradoxes which will become evident because one of the features of the Tarash defense is usually that isolated queen's pawn which can emerge. Karpov did play uh, c takes d5 after e takes d5, uh, g3. So the classic fianchetto against this system uh, is very, very solid and very useful to fianchetto the bishop. It's immediately going to be targeting d5 in various uh, instances later. Bishop e7, both sides castle, knight c3, knight c6, bishop g5, c takes d4. I think this is all fairly theoretical in the Tarash. Knight takes d4. Now black plays h6, it's the main move. The bishop now uh, retreats. This is actually the main move, not to take on f6, not to volunteer that bishop here. And now we see rook e8. And the main move is actually rook c1 here statistically, but queen b3 was played, which is another good move. Knight a5, the queen drops back to c2. We see bishop g4. Now knight f5, this is uh, the main move here, knight f5. Rook c8 is played. Another idea is to try and preserve the bishop actually with bishop b4, not to give white the option anyway of knight takes e7. Uh, but uh, rook c8 was played. Now only rarely actually it is actually taken here. This is the main move, bishop d4, putting pressure on the king's side. White really wants black to give up the light square bishop here. Karpov now um, has this nice blockade on Kasparov isolated uh, queen's pawn. So Kasparov plays now bishop c5, which is which is actually the most frequently move, uh, played move in that position as well. And we have bishop takes c5, rook takes c5. So out of the opening phase, quite a long opening phase, uh, we're still in quite a, a trotting path actually. There's more than 10 games on on my live book here with knight e3 now being played. And obviously there's a lot of intense pressure emerging here. Let's add a bit so on the isolated queen's pawn. And you might think, well, can it be moved forward? Uh, if d4, I think we just we just pin it basically to the queen, and then there's, it's it's a bit in trouble. Queen d3, why well, it's going to be better? But uh, no, that wasn't that wasn't played. Just bishop bishop e6 was played here. Now rook a d1. White's position looks absolutely harmonious and quite elegant. I mean, look at this. This these knights just staring at d5, Fincheso with bishop. It's like White has achieved what he wanted out of the opening. You know, nice, comfortable pressure, it seems, against the isolated Queen's pawn. It's an absolute classic encounter. This I must I must stress this uh, for what we're about to witness uh, from this position. Because you might think, well, how exactly is the isolated Queen's pawn exploited? Uh, one of the things I'd like to emphasize is that sometimes uh, a kind of apparent obvious structural uh, weakness needs to be translated somehow often into a more exploitable weakness. And here it's ever so subtle how this can be achieved. Let's see, Queen C8, and it looks as though Black's got significant uh, pressure. This move actually makes sure, for example, B4 is, is now stopped, the pressure on C3 here. And Black might actually, if he's given the move, might consider B5. Uh, white plays queen a4. Okay. And 
okay where is black going to get his counterplay from he plays rook d8 rook d3 for the moment you know the queen's helping to stop the pawn the pawn is restrained at the moment a6 and it looks as though maybe b5 is going to be useful to black or knight c4 here because the bishop is helping support a knight c4 in fact after rook fd1 again one can only marvel at the elegance of white setup here against the United isolated queen's pawn so Kasparov wants to generate some counterplay uh, but how did I say b5 before that would just lose a piece b5 just loses a piece here just the queen takes a5 we can't lose that connection of the knight uh, so that's the knight has to move before any b5 consideration so here in fact we do see knight c4 and white now plays knight takes c4 so d takes of course we've got rook takes d8 so the isolated queen's pawn is preserved here queen a5 and there's a bit of pressure on the dark squares note here in this configuration this light square bishop is on the same color complex as these pawns here white's pawns in general there's quite a few of them on dark squares so potentially the, the potential for harmony between the pawns and the bishops uh, kind of almost favor white if there's a transition into an end game something to bear in mind for later we see rook c5 queen b6 like teasing black with this pressure uh, does black have to be careful let's, let's let's just try rook c6 that might be playable i mean the queen just drops back even to b3 because of that enormous pin on on the deep on it so so black didn't bother with that it just played rook d7 we see rook d4 and now queen c7 you might think that's a little bit unusual offering exchange of queens if you've got a structural defect but maybe Sparf reckons uh, that it, the defect wasn't that bad so Karpov took off the queens d takes and here is there any rush to try and uh, well what happens if knight takes d5 then I think it's going to be about equal here after bishop takes uh, rook takes d5 this is about equal because black I think has sufficient compensation with rook c2 so that shows it's not that easy to try and exploit the that queen's pawn if you're in that position like this it's just about, it's virtually dead equal so let's go back Karpov instead played h3 so he wants to somehow torture Kasparov from this position this simplified position uh, Kasparov now plays h5 perhaps trying to prevent g4 from here g4 might be a very useful uh, space game move so h5 prevents that a3 is now played so this might be useful for later an outpost maybe on c5 for a knight we see g6 e3 pawns are also being put of course on dark squares complementing the bishop whilst black's bishop is on the same color as squares of these as most of the pawns in fact all of them here in fact king g7 king h2 are these small advantages enough though we see now Xparov volunteering an exchange of rooks so he's not minding further simplification now bishop f3 but he doesn't play rook takes d4 himself instead b5 is played is black actually threatening anything well not really any b4 we can just play a takes b4 here we see king g2 now rook seven to c5 and here Karpov takes on c4 now this is quite interesting if d takes c4 white would get a small advantage here with rook d6 this is a bit annoying to get behind these pawns like this it's a more active rook perhaps a situation to avoid black is dropping a pawn here and it might be uh, quite it might be decisive to lose a pawn like that so instead we see rook takes c4 that looks fairly sensible the other option b takes uh, let's have a look at b takes rook d4 
and white can start pressing with g4 maybe and g5 to try and put pressure on d5 later so the g4 plan in relation to d5 is quite important here this is a very very comfortable position for white so here okay we see rook takes c4 rook d4 and this is a bit of a surprise move rook d4 you might think well this was the structural weakness of Sussex queen's pawn in the frontal pressure and Karpov is volunteering a symmetrical pawn structure situation so why king f8 and he's not just volunteering it here he's positively encouraging it with bishop e2 asking the rook either to take or to move back now if the rook moved back then for example rook c7 well there's a4 that, that's pretty dangerous for the structure on the queen side actually so you'd have to be very careful where to move this rook, rook back if rook c6 then bishop d3 and potentially white can build for the future maybe with f3 and g4 later to try and put pressure on d5 slowly but uh, rook takes d4 and you might think there's nothing here surely after e takes d4 and this is the very very subtle thing about this Karpov game is that um, the Tarash has been used to get this end game without it seems a major structural defect but uh, look at the harmony the slight harmony difference of the bishop and its pawns are on the uh, opposite color of the bishop here this bishop is on the same color as the pawns here is that enough to win this sort of position king e7 knight a2 and it looks as though knight b4 is immediately useful to either attack the pawn or maybe even find a way to get to c5 or e5 we see bishop c8 uh, and now knight b4 and now a5 there's knight c6 check i think let's just check this a5 knight c6 check and then that will drop a pawn so the pawn can't be simply moved here we see king d6 f3 denying um knight the e4 square but putting a pawn on the same color though knight g8 now h4 and prof is trying to maneuver his knight to f5 to put pressure on d4 so in fact it's white's d pawn which is on the fire now after knight f5 it's protected with knight c2 f6 and i think this is where the game was actually adjourned a lot of the german analysis must have took place and um on resumption i think this was played bishop d3 now so with the germans you do get sometimes very profound deep analysis of positions uh, so possibly you know some of the credit might be the help of the seconds the quality of the seconds takes a, a um, part of the credit maybe for some of creativity which we're about to witness but uh, let's see in this position Kasparov he's trailing um, three losses already and he plays what seems to be quite an active move uh, potentially trying to get maybe an outside past pawn um, here you know you can imagine knight e7 and wondering isn't this just a draw what what would white have if knight e7 let's have a look knight e3 well the bishops on the same color as the pawns is that a decisive uh, thing potentially g4 just following this through a little bit g takes g takes we've got fragments fragmented pawn structure here is this really enough this kind of position even if we got rid of the knights here it's a small edge for white but it's hard to imagine this being uh decisive but uh, in the game we get this kind of aggressive looking move uh, in any case which is g5 so how to react to this now if f takes g5 then f takes g5 and maybe black's got potential for creating an outside pass pawn here but uh, g4 might uh, stop that plan and here it looks as though unless white blunders horrifically with F fg trying to lose a pawn uh, this this should be okay this even this position after 93 that tempo gain fg and we're looking at uh, a drawn position but um what we see actually here 
is the immediate bishop takes f5, which may be one of the very strongest moves in the position. So getting this end game, the knight versus bishop. I said before, um, the bishop is on the same color as the pawns. A lot of these pawns, these three here, at least in this one at the moment. So can the knight demonstrate superiority? Knight e3. And these pawns are, of course, on dark squares away from the bishop, so they're invulnerable to the bishop at the moment. Bishop b1. B4 now fixes down this structure here. You can imagine even this a, if even if a3 was missing, black's pretty restrained here with that b4 now being played. Now Kasparov played g takes h4. And this is a really, really interesting move of the game. You might think in this fairly innocuous capture on h4 how would you respond to this um if i gave you 10 seconds or well, you might want to pause the video actually uh, it might seem like a dumb question to ask but how would you respond to it so um i'll let you maybe pause the video or 10 seconds starting from now white play Okay, now I'm checking this actually with Houdini 4 at certain depth 28. And indeed, there's a fractional difference I'm spotting between what was played in just the ordinary recapture. Now, the ordinary recapture uh, might not lead to anything that significant. So there's actually no um, route for the king here to get into black's position. I think that's a key fundamental point. Um, to consider as well as just brute you know calculation of variations i mean we just need to consider the practicality of access here how does the king gain access to black's position there's going to be no front of attack opportunities on the pawn on h5 on f4 the bishop's always eyeing this diagonal how is the king ever going to get to f5 and also this king can help with king e6 what was actually played is actually an extraordinary move extraordinarily powerfully um, uh, a vivid move because a lot of people celebrate this next move knight g2 now I don't think Sparth in particular celebrates this move because he considers it as part of adjournment analysis because after move 42 it was adjourned what on earth is this to lose a pawn I think the fundamental thing is the access routes uh, given for the white king here now let's consider h3 I don't think we could I can we'll rule this out knight f4 and here if if we try and move the pawn then king g2 we're grabbing the pawn we have a beautiful knight on f4 it looks as though that's terrible for black um, that's going to be losing h5 after losing h2 and if we consider in this position bishop f5 then actually um, just knight takes h5 will do here any h2 is king g2 also as well king g1 might be quite good as well uh, but just the port that the h3 pawn is not going anywhere so this is to be avoided uh, h3 so that leaves what was played uh, really there isn't too much else uh, to consider because now white has given himself the option of knight takes h4 and the king can later pop to h4 and hit h5 frontally so that's a key difference, not to have a pawn on h4, but to leave that available. For example, if king c7, then we take with the knight, not with the pawn. And then we, I think we can just start working our way with the king quite slowly, because black's actually not doing anything in this position. That, you know, these pawns are, in, are on away from the color of the bishop. I think mean, we can start working our way with the king. And, the, you know, pawns are going to drop anyway here. So that looks like um, pointless to it to do that, to allow that. Kasparov just took on g3 here, but we have now quite a dangerous king being able to use the h4 square. Can black still really lose this now from this position? Let's see, king e6. Now the immediate uh, king h4 might not be that great. 
because of king f5 black's going to get an active king surely if taking here there's actually a fantastic uh, resource in this particular position which I think needs uh, to be mentioned it looks as though the knight's keeping out the king and the king's sort of making its way into black's position but actually bishop e4 uh, this is just the variation if bishop e4 for example taking taking and the king is going to start mopping up all the white pawns and that's going to be uh, a draw so bishop e4 actually is quite dangerous it secures um, I think I'll draw this position this this tactic so this has to be avoided actually and Karpov's move is actually knight f4 check so he's delicately treading around here knight f4 check now if king f5 in this position well that was actually played so let's have a look at the game continuation now knight takes h5 there's no uh, problem here with bishop e4 bishop e4 wasn't played we, we just we just take and in this position we can take and we're actually quick enough to I think remain with one pawn just about because the knight's heading there if we get this position unfortunately for black this is losing just that one pawn support by the knight is enough that's a very very critical difference actually um, if you if you just just review that there why that wouldn't have worked earlier on King h4 that the king was just, I think too far away really uh, to help matters in this position after Bishop e4 uh, that there's, there's no such opportunity of the Knight getting so quickly to d5 to protect b4 so the way this is played is very very accurate so check then taking on h5 King e6 and then knight plays a check so we have this classic end game now and this was this was actually a recent question on reddit uh, that if you have pawns of a certain color and you're against a knight you know what what ideal ideally should the color of this bishop be well if there's a knight it can try and attack and it's going to attack from the dark squares these light square pawns so sometimes maybe it's more defensive paradoxically to have a dark square bishop to try and prevent the knight attacking the pawns for example c5 would attack a6 if the knight got to c5 so if we had a dark square bishop it might actually be helping more to defend the light square pawns than a light square bishop and i think we're going to have a vivid demonstration of this paradoxical idea here that now we have this light square bishop which in theory you might think helps defend light square pawns but is it prone to for example being overloaded especially if the king is about to make an entrance but king g4 bishops cutting off the king for a moment the king's trying to make its way though to attack f6 from the side and it does so but bishop d1 is it going neglect, to neglect f3 it does king g6 that is a light square pawn leaving only dark square pawns away from the bishops glare if bishop takes f3 now bishop takes f3 wasn't played but this is actually a winning position for white if we look at this position here because the knight can simply maneuver I think to c5 and let's have a quick look uh, here bishop g4 knight g2 let's maneuver the knight it, it, let's just put the bishop here and see what's what's going on here or in fact the king can can start overloading the black position like this so this this kind of check to drive the king away then king e5 so the bishop is also having trouble defending against the king walking on dark squares that can be critical for black so let's go back so that wasn't elected from Alex Barf. He, he played king e7 dropping d5 it's 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 really um looking bad to give up d5 knight takes d5 king e6 knight c7 check king d7 and now this other pawn is taken is Karpov um, okay to, to win these pawns we see bishop takes f3 for the moment he's just one pawn up now two pawns up king takes f6 
King D6. Although this king looks almost aggressive enough to try and take this pawn out. King F5, King D5. King F4 attacking the bishop, gaining a tempo to protect the pawn. Bishop H1, King E3. King C4. Now Knight C5 stops King B3 here. Bishop C6. So how can White increase the advantage here? Where can the Knight uh, maneuver, for example? This pawn is restraining both these pawns for the moment. Knight D3. Bishop G2. It looks as though this is quite a powerful light square blockade. Check. King C3. Uh, if King D5, well then King D3 and then White can probably make uh, progress like that. So check King C3. Still have the option of King B3 one day perhaps. Now Knight G6 is played. And here we see King C4. Knight E7. Bishop B7. Knight F5. Bishop G2. Now finally the Knight's reached its ideal destination to win another pawn. Knight D6 check. This is the idea to win that B5 pawn. King B3. Knight takes B5. And this is now overwhelming material advantage. After knight d6 here on move 70, Kasparov actually resigned. And at this point in the match, believe it or not, in the 1984 match, Karpov was actually leading 4 0 with 5 draws. And the general perception it was going to be uh, one of the most one sided world championship matches in the history of chess. <laughs> As it turned out, it was an amazing match, which eventually was aborted with Karpov being utterly exhausted. Exhausted. Uh, there's a lot of finesses in this knight versus bishop end game uh, to study. It is it is worthy of study. Uh, just just going back, um, I mean, for example, one note here: King B3, King D3 takes King C3. This this is good. For white as well, because we've now got this past d pawn. We just shut the king off. How we just move the uh, start moving the d pawn? Yeah, if the bishop, if the king's out of the game here, then d5. That's enough to win that position. But the, the, it's a very very delicate end game, uh, and I think the most memorable part of it for me is this dramatic dynamism dynamism expressed with knight g2. It uh, just shows that if you're going to win a knight versus bishop ending, I think this is one of the classics uh, in the history of chess to study, especially this knight g2. But it was played after an you know in an adjournment, so um, that that can lead to very very high quality end game play indeed. Yeah, this is a super dynamic move knight g2. I don't know how many of us would have just routinely uh, just taken the pawn in our own games. But um, you know, there's a fundamental thing that the king needs to go around and start be able to attack pawns either frontally or from the side, and this this knight maneuver facilitated that. But the the other paradoxical thing uh, about this game is is like I say, queen's pawn scenario where you know white didn't mind uh, f having a pawn on d4 as well, so he lost rights to the frontal attack on blacks. I say queen's pawn. It was other advantages, uh, you know, the slight coordinate, uh, the better color complex coordination of the bishop and the pawns. If we have a look earlier in the game, another critical moment where it seems how do you how do you actually exploit the tarish defense as I say queen's pawn? It's a fascinating thing to consider that paradoxically you don't you you kind of have this sort of position and rely on you know, if if the bishop. Might be a bit worse than than your bishop in the end game. So there's some very interesting potential lessons here for how to conduct knight and bishop end games. And uh, yeah, it was it led to being four 0 up at this stage of the match. Very very dramatic, uh, historically important game, and it really put Gary Kasparov under intense pressure, uh, not to be utterly humiliated, of course. Uh, 
So could he could he turn back the match after this? Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.